Well, uh, thanks to Leonardo, Colin, for, for organizing. Can you send us? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, cool. It's just I'm arrows. Nice. Um, yeah, thanks, guys, for organizing um, the user group meeting kind of on the end of the, the course, um, the two days of coursework. Um, yeah, it's great to get together, hear what everybody else is up to, and kind of learn from one another uh, as we go. So um, happy to be here today. Um, and so I'm going to be talking kind of explicitly about something that several of the other presenters have really been, um, I think, uh, kind of spelling out just in different ways. And that is that STSIM, I think, can really be viewed as a tool for leveraging several other um, methods. And uh, we heard about, you know, for instance, with, with Catherine's work, uh, linking to Farsight, bringing in habitat suitability maps, things like that. Um, you know, Colin mentioned the biogeochemical model, kind of bringing in output from that. Um, so what I'm going to do is take sort of a broad, um, fairly shallow look at three different um, case studies that I think continue to kind of demonstrate this message. Um, and I'll just say that although I'm the only person listed here uh, on the title slide, you'll notice there's a variety of co-authors on a bunch of these projects, several of whom are in this room. So um, it is certainly not just me who's doing this work. Um, so a bit of background on, on sort of where I'm coming from and, and that I think provides good context for the case studies I'll be describing. So I work for um, uh, the North Central Climate Science Center, one of eight climate science centers in the country. And really our mandate is to provide um, uh, science that supports um, climate adaptation, um, particularly for Department of Interior Natural Resource Management agencies. So for instance, National Park Service is one of our partners. Um, and you know they're, they're sort of, uh, as, as are many of us at this point where we're recognizing, hey, there's already climate changes happening. Um, everybody's telling us and we're expecting additional changes to be coming in the future that are probably gonna have really big consequences for the resources that we care about. Um, and so we need to do something, right? Um, but then if we go and even for a particular location, we look at some of the climate projections. Um, this is just sort of temp and precip for a given location in South Dakota. Um, there's quite a lot of uncertainty around um, you know, temperature, we, we can expect it to get warmer, but how much is rather uncertain. Precipitation, in some cases, we don't know um, uh, the direction, let alone the magnitude of change. And so with this kind of a situation, you know, what are we supposed to do? Uh, we're kind of in, in a pickle here. We, there's some serious changes that are already happening that are coming, and we, we need to do something, but there's a lot of uncertainty. And on top of that, we're dealing with these complex uh, social ecological systems that could respond in a whole variety of different ways. And so, um, you know, clearly there's not going to be one sort of magic bullet for, um, you know, helping us to answer this question or address this challenge. Rather, I think we can use a variety of tools to help address different aspects of this challenge. I've listed a couple here. Um, of course, there are many others that can, can help us as well. Um, and so, uh, several years ago, uh, Jeff Morissette and I um, sort of I sat down and, and came up with this analytical framework for linking together a variety of different tools. And at the time, um, it was fairly sort of conceptual. We sort of put some meat on the bones in terms of what each of the arrows means and how we would actually connect some of these things. But it wasn't demonstrated at that time, by our work anyway, of how those linkages might actually be done sort of methodologically. Um, and so what I want to do today is walk through three different portions of this framework. I'm not going to linger on the framework itself. Um, but I will return to it a number of times just to illustrate where I am. Um, so the first case study, which several of you will have heard about, um, is work linking species distribution models with state and transition simulations. The second is going to be linking a more qualitative tool, scenario planning, uh, with state and transition simulations. And the third, um, ongoing work linking an agent-based modeling approach with state and transition simulations. So um, the first one here, I'll dive right into the species distribution modeling work. Um, so, you know, species distribution models, as many of you know, um, their, their strong suit is, is sort of the ability to statistically relate species locations, their presences and absences, um, to uh, environmental and climatic covariates, right? Um, and they're widely used, widely accepted as, a, as a, a good tool for looking at potential climate impacts on suitable habitat. Um, and so I think for that reason, it's worth us paying attention to them. Um, but of course, uh, Folks recognize that, um, sorry, I don't know if my fonts got screwed up here. I think classic Mac PC um, translation error. Um, but the main message is that 
they're useful, but they don't do everything. Um, they project suitable habitats, um, not where the actual species will be. And part of the reason for that is that they don't account for other processes like disturbances, competition, management. And these are all things that are really well captured by state and transition simulations. So that's what led us to say, okay, well, why don't we use the two together? So we did some work on white bark pine um, in the greater Yellowstone region where we built a, a state and transition model um, of white bark. Um, and then for a portion of that model, we dictated uh, the transition probabilities, in particular the transition probabilities for the, the transition from a seed or a propagule to a seedling um, by using species distribution model output. And this is something that, again, I think Catherine was alluding to in her presentation, where we could use the habitat suitability maps, which are essentially um, grids of probabilities, to, in a spatially explicit way, drive the likelihood that white bark pine could establish at any given cell in the landscape. And then on top of that, we ran multiple different species distribution models for different climate scenarios and updated uh, these rasters through time and across different climate scenarios. So really the, 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 the key, key feature here that we were leveraging was the spatial multiplier function, which you guys all heard about in the course of the last few days. Now, sort of the, the limitation of this approach was that we were sort of selecting um, you know, climate scenarios um, that, you know, we thought were probably most relevant to white bark pine. We weren't really layering on top management scenarios at the time. And in order to really select highly relevant both climate and management scenarios, um, you need a more structured and, in my mind, more formalized process for doing that, at least doing it in a meaningful way that would be useful and relevant to managers. And so that's sort of the next thing I want to talk about is this combination of scenario planning and simulation modeling. So scenario planning um, is a bit different uh, than perhaps traditional approaches where you might sort of forecast and plan for one future with some range of uncertainty around it. Rather, you're trying to plan for a divergent array of plausible futures. And um, in essence, what, what it is, it's, it's a structured approach to um, make decisions under uncertain and uncontrollable conditions, much like climate change. Um, and just to emphasize, this is a tool to offer a range of plausible futures. You're not trying to say, well, this future is most likely, um, and so that's the one we're going to go with. Rather, you're saying, hey, here's a different set of possible futures based on different assumptions, um, and how might things play out under those different scenarios. I think this is a rather intuitive thing. We all, I think, in some way or another, do scenario planning, even on a day-to-day -day basis. If you think about, you know, are you going to... Um, bring your umbrella to work or not, and you haven't checked the weather forecast, you think about, well, um, you know, what are the general, you know, generally speaking, what are, what's weather like at this time of year? What would the consequences be if I don't or if I do bring it? These are all kinds of things that we do internally on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but scenario planning, at least in this context, is a much more structured and sort of facilitated process for bringing together a group of, of partners, of stakeholders, and having them think through the ramifications and responses to different scenarios. Um, so this, is, this has been really useful in a variety of settings, including industry. Um, this was really pioneered by um, Royal Dutch Shell, funny enough, um, and uh, been used by places like UPS, the military uses scenario planning, and National Park Service has been using it with success since about 2006. Um, but what uh, we've been hearing is that this sort of largely qualitative um, approach, although useful and really helping to get people engaged, it faces some limitations um, in that managers often either need or just want quantitative information. They sometimes feel more comfortable with it or they require it in order to justify a change in their management actions. And I think we have to recognize too that there are just limits to our brain power. You know, when we sit around a table and try to think out the different possible um, outcomes of different climate scenarios, there's a lot going on in these systems that we can't necessarily track. And, and that's what, why we have computers to sort of expand our brain power. So um, we're just wrapping up a project now in Southwest South Dakota, where we combined uh, state and transition simulation modeling and scenario planning. Um, so we, it was our job to kind of bring to the table a set of uh, climate scenarios um, to work through with our management partners. Um, and these were selected based on their relevance for some key resources in the area, including grasslands and, and grazers. 
Um, so we had some facilitated workshops with the management partners to help us think through what the impacts of those different climate scenarios would be for their resources. And in parallel, we developed a simulation model, um, at least for some of their resources, particularly the um, grassland vegetation um, that's um, important for bison and livestock in the area. Um, and then ran those simulations for the same four climate scenarios and also for four different management alternatives. And the managers helped us to flesh out those management alternatives where we varied things like prescribed fire, um, the intensity, timing, and location of grazing, um, and invasive species inventory and treatment. So um, the idea being that, hey, let's use these two tools, kind of uh, learn, you know, learn from the two processes and compare results at the end. Um, and so in some ways, the development of the simulation followed kind of the traditional, you know, um, process of kind of developing some conceptual models, building the simulation, maybe doing some revisions, um, uh, updating parameters and running the simulations. But um, in our case, we really did a lot of iteration with the management partners together with the scenario planning process to help us sort of uh, parameterize the model, uh, refine the conceptual models. Um, evaluate the model and, and so forth. So um, I just wanted to emphasize with this slide that this is really a co-production effort between the scientists and, and the management sides of the project. Um, and so now, we're now at a point where we can look at results. I'm, gonna, I'm just showing a subset and, and I'm not going to go through this whole table where we can say, okay, well, what did people tell us in the scenario planning workshops might happen with something like uh, primary production um, under some of the drier or the wetter climate scenarios? And does that agree with what the simulation model is telling us and, and why? Um, so one example that was sort of a surprising or, or sort of interesting contrast was that in the workshops, um, the expectation was that, okay, under the dry scenarios, primary production would go down, makes sense. And because of that, we would probably need to, to reduce, say, our, our bison herd size in the national park, you know, to make sure that we're not sort of overgrazing, we're planning for the really dry years. Um, but when we when we looked at the modeling results, although yeah, of course it was true that um, primary production and live biomass was lower under the drier scenarios, um, there was sort of some wiggle room there. There was live biomass available at the end of the growing season um, at, at peak live biomass, regardless of the climate scenario or management alternative. So that's perhaps a bit of a check on sort of the doom and gloom that I think often comes out of scenario planning work. You know, we tend to sort of sit around the table and think about some dire consequences. And I think in this case, anyway, the simulation put a little bit more realism on that and said, well, hold on a second. We might actually have a little, a few, we have, may have more options than we think we do. So I think uh, we're, st we're starting to digest these results and some interesting points of, of comparison. Um, but I did want to just touch on, particularly given that you guys had the class the last few days, the things that made this work possible. Um, some of it was methodological. So Amy Simstad um, and, and myself and others sort of um, used a, a framework for integrating these two modeling or these two tools. Um, the expert elicitation piece of it was really huge. A lot of our model parameters came from the experts themselves and you know thanks to Leonardo and his experience doing this in other settings and sort of some creative work along the way uh, we were able to sort of integrate expert input into the model. Um, and then uh, I just wanted to point as well to uh, Mike O'Donnell's work, previous work on um, high performance uh, computing methods. So our model um, was taking a really long time to run on my own laptop, so we we used his approach to run the model on the Yeti supercomputer down in Denver um, and did it remotely. So, um, a thanks to him for for sort of uh, pioneering those approaches. Um, on the software side, just a few that I'll mention. Um, really, you know, the command line version of STSIM was what allowed us to run those uh, you know HPC runs down on the Yeti supercomputer. Um, sort of a neat recent development that was really helpful relating to the expert elicitation work. Um, from the expert input, we created um, distributions um, for the uh, transition multipliers. And so we could sample from those um, custom distributions to influence our all of our, or not all of our, but most of our transitions. And then finally, uh, Colin talked about the stock flow module within STSIM. We we're also able to sort of use that for tracking primary production and biomass. Um, so the last piece here that I'm going to talk about, some ongoing work with Leonardo and others. Um, in doing this, uh, and even previously, but especially with this work, 
we're working in a landscape where there are bison and livestock that are moving around the landscape and um, affecting the, the vegetation. And um, although we included grazing uh, and grazing impacts and grazer preferences even, um, I, it faced some limitations in some ways. So the, the locations of water sources, for instance, weren't something that we used in our simulation to drive where animals might go. Um, and, and although we used grazing preferences, it wasn't really done in a spatially explicit way. Um, these are sort of, um, I guess, hypothetical animals that aren't actually moving around on the simulated landscape and making choices. And, and this is why, um, and this has important consequences for landscape condition. Um, and this is why there are agent-based models, um, which in essence simulate agents. It could be anything. It could be a bison. It could be a virus. It could be a person. Um, anything that's sort of an autonomous unit um, that moves around a landscape and makes decisions about um, how it interacts with the environment, how it interacts with other agents. Um, and thus, the agents sort of um, interact directly with their environment. So on this picture, you can't really see, but the brown spots here are a little like you know, fake bison that move around according to sets of rules that the user specifies. And those rules could be related to the location of water sources or what they prefer to graze on or, or the availability of biomass. So essentially providing a more nuanced um, way of representing um, things like wildlife and their effects on, on the landscape. So um, what we're doing now is connecting these two approaches. Um, so here's just sort of a, um, a conceptual model for the work we're doing now where SD-SIM is sort of the orange boxes here. We're sort of having it be in charge of things like state classes, primary production, biomass. And then that logo, the agent-based modeling platform we're using, represents bison as agents that move around uh, the landscape according to the location of water sources, state classes um, that they prefer to graze on. And then as they sort of graze on the landscape, that goes back and affects um, the state and transition model itself. And the way that we're doing this, um, so the, this communication between the two models is through R. So R is really driving um, sort of the state and transition model and the, the net logo model as well. And in order to do this, we need a few things. Um, one big one is the R synchrosim package um, that uh, we can now drive STSIM from R. And there's an existing uh, sort of uh, sister package, if you will, for NetLogo, the R NetLogo package, um, where uh, you can run NetLogo from R. So it's nice that uh, we sort of now have these two companion um, packages uh, to run the two models. And importantly, as a part of this, there's a, an ability to um, call SDSIM from R for as many time steps as you like. In our case, we might run it for a single time step, pause the model, take output from STSIM, for instance, the state class layer, pass it over to NetLogo, run NetLogo for a time step, track where bison went on the landscape, where they grazed, where they didn't, and then pass that information back to STSIM and run it again. So you need to be able to not just sort of stop, stop the model and start it over and run it again, you need to be able to pause it at each time step. And that's the breakpoints function, and that's what um, is really making this work. Um, and the other thing that we're now sort of developing, uh, or we've been talking to Leonardo about working with Alex Embry to develop, um, is this notion of uh, stock flow multipliers. So we've, we've heard about, and you guys have been talking about and using trans, um, spatial multipliers. So you might, mul you might multiply the probability of a transition um, according to a raster. In this case, um, we would directly affect um, flows of something like uh, biomass by a similar in a similar way with a raster from NetLogo. So we might say, all right, let's um, output a raster of where grazing transitions happened on the landscape and use that then to directly drive um, biomass rather than say a transition within the SDSIM, you're directly affecting a thing like biomass. So that's kind of something that we're, we've been talking about. We don't have that capability yet, but it's sort of on the way. Um, so, you know, to sort of one last time kind of jump back to this figure, I just want to emphasize that, you know, really at the center of all this, of course, is uh, STSIM. And um, it's really remarkable to me that it has, um, you know, over the, over the years kind of built out the capacity to link to these various modeling types and others that we've heard about today. Um, and, and so in my mind, it's a really powerful tool. 
um, and allows us to kind of leverage these, these various other tools that I've been talking about. Um, and so, yeah, we've kind of been doing it piecemeal. I think going forward, um, I would you know, hope that we can kind of work toward a more seamless integration between these different um, methods with, with SD Sim really at the center. Um, so thanks, and I don't know if we have time for questions. Yeah, we have but... time for a couple of questions. Cool.